Hello and welcome to the Catholic Experience, recorded Thursday, November 16th, in the year of our Lord, 2023. I'm very happy that you're joining me. I am the Catholic Adventurer, and today we'll be talking about the importance of meditating on Scripture. I put the emphasis on the wrong syllable there, meditating. We'll be talking about meditating on Scripture, the importance of meditating on Scripture. And then afterward, I'm going to roll an interview that I had with a very interesting man named Brother Alexander, all the way from jolly old England, and he's going to, well, we're going to have a conversation, he and I, about typology and the importance and and uh, the interesting factor of typology in Scripture. So we're talking it up about Bible, Bible, Bible today. Why are we talking about the Bible? Why Everybody knows the Bible is important, right? Interesting that as Catholics, we don't, we don't feel we have to read the Bible because we have the Scriptures read to us at every Mass. there At Sunday Mass, there's the first reading and the second reading. Usually the first is the Old Testament, the second is the New Testament, one of Paul's letters. And then we have the Gospel read to us. And then, hopefully, ideally, we have the Gospel explained to us or contextualized and applied in the homily. That's usually how it goes. And then, of course, during the daily Mass, there's one reading instead of two, and then there's the Gospel. So why should we talk about Scripture? What's so important about it if it's already read to us? Why are Protestants always on about Scripture anyway? I'm not going to get into that part, though I would have a lot to say about that. It's important to read Scripture for a few reasons. Hopefully, everyone listening to this has a copy of the Bible at home, and hopefully it's a Catholic Bible, otherwise you're missing seven books. But how many listening to this actually read it on a regular basis? Probably very few. But it's important to open it up and read it, even if you're not going cover to cover, even if you're just flipping to random pages, or maybe you have a more methodical approach. Maybe you start with the Gospels. However you do it, it's important to open it up, open the Bible, and actually read it. Because the Bible is the Word of God. It's God's revelation to to man. A lot of people say, you know, the Bible is like an instruction manual for life. I, I get that, but I think there's more to it than that. The Bible is part of God's revelation of all reality. It doesn't reveal everything in reality, but it reveals all reality. What's the difference? For instance, you are not going to open the Bible and get a science textbook or a mathematics textbook. Or, I mean, there is there are history books in it but you're not going to get world history from it, right? It doesn't reveal all facts, but it reveals all reality. The mind of God, the person of God, the the character of God, the nature of God and the nature of what he created, the nature of of the created order as God designed and and developed it. You don't come away from the Bible with all of the answers. It's impossible. But you do come away from Scripture progressively, with all of the understanding, and that's the truth. Reading the Scriptures tells us who God is and what He expects of us, not just as a people, right, not just as the human race, but what He expects of us as individuals. Reading Scripture gives you an insight into not just what God wants, but why He wants that. Some of the importance of reading and meditating on Scripture. Now, that's key here, is the meditating part. It's not just the reading part, okay? We're going to be talking about, or we will be talking about, why it's important not just to read it, but to meditate on it. I'll bet many people listening to this don't don't even know what that means, to meditate on it. We're going to talk about that a little bit. So one of the reasons why it's important to read and meditate on the Bible is you gain a deeper appreciation and understanding of God's revelation. A deeper appreciation and understanding of God's revelation. The facts of what you read are not enough. There's more that God is putting into Scripture than just the facts. Adam and Eve did. Moses said. Jesus went to, and then he did. There's more to it than just the facts. I think a lot of people go to Scripture, and what they're analyzing or paying most attention to, if not total attention to it, 
is the facts. Second to the facts, they try to establish meaning, right? They try to interpret what does this mean. That's natural, right? But there's more to the scriptures than that. There's more to the, just the facts and, and the meaning and the interpretation. There's more to it than just text. There's a person behind the text. There's, a live, there's life behind the text. There's a person behind the text. God is that person. Learn from him. Learn from him. You won't just learn from him by reading the text and, and trying to interpret it. You'll get something from that. Yes, you sure, you, you sure will. But you won't really connect to the person behind the words in the text if all you're doing is reading it. For instance, in today's Mass reading, the first, the first reading today was uh, Wisdom, uh, looks like chapter 7, verse 22. And I'm just going to recite a, a couple of lines for you. So wi- the, you might have guessed it, but Wisdom here is talking about wisdom. You guessed it. And this is toward the bottom of the reading. And she, Wisdom, who is one, can do all things and renews everything, and passing into holy souls from age to age, she produces friends of God and prophets. Now, you can spend all the time in the world reading that. It's very poetic, right? Reading it and trying to interpret um, what it means, but there's something deeper than just the text and the meaning. Meaning is deeper than the text, and life is even deeper than meaning. There's life behind the text. Here's something that stands out to me as I meditate on it, which I have done in the past. This is I didn't just write, just now do this, but this is something that I've meditated on in the past. She produces friends of God. When you're meditating or when you sit down to read the Bible with the intent to meditate, the Holy Spirit will make something pop out at you. What once popped out at me was that line. She produces, in other words, wisdom. Wisdom produces friends of God. Of God. Well, why does that stand out? Well, I gave it a think. What does that mean? Produces friends of God, and I, I'm not going to go through the whole process with you. But here's what I what I take take away from it, following a period of meditation on it. And you might have heard me say this in maybe in something that I wrote or in another podcast episode. God has many fans, but He does not have many friends. Do you see the difference? God has many, many fans, people who believe in God, um, but they never go to church, or people who believe in God and praise God, even at Mass. But he doesn't have many friends. I'm not going to go through the whole difference between fans and friends. I think you can figure that out on your own, right? God has many fans, but he does not have many friends. What does that have to do with wisdom? Again, I'm not going to go through the whole thought process with you, but sometimes you'll take a you'll take a truth from the text that may not directly have to do with the text. What I took from the Book of Wisdom didn't have a whole lot to do with wisdom itself, right? What I, the truth that I took from it was sparked by something in the Book of Wisdom, but it had nothing to do with wisdom itself, not necessarily, or not not especially, right? God has many fans, but he doesn't have many friends. And then that made me think, am I a good friend to God? Am I a good friend to Jesus? Me, personally. Am I a good friend to Jesus? Am I a good friend to God? Or am I really just a fanatic, a fan? And then that makes me analyze, It makes me analyze my own devotion, my own closeness to God, my own faithfulness to God. And I took all of this from one line that stood out in the Book of Wisdom. That wisdom produces many, I'm sorry, wisdom produces friends of God and prophets. Friends of God. God has many fans, but he doesn't have many friends in this world. So the facts of the text are not enough. There's a person behind the text. Learn from him. But you can't learn from him if you're not listening, if you're not reflecting deeply on the text. Another thing that's important about meditating on Scripture is you begin to appreciate that we have the whole story. 
whereas the ancients only had fragments. We have the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. But, but the ancients only had bits and pieces of, of what we consider the whole. They had a few scriptures. Some of them only had one. For instance, in the time of Moses and the Israelites, Genesis was being written. They didn't even have Genesis. Not, not completely. They had oral tradition. They had what's in Genesis, but they didn't have the book of Genesis. And so on and so on and so on. So the apostles, for instance, had the, the books of the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament. They had all of that. But not every synagogue in Israel had every book of what we call the Old Testament. We have the whole picture, the whole story that God was writing. Because as soon as the first word of Genesis was written, right, it was written by the hand of Moses, but it was written by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the author. As soon as the first word was written, God already knew what the last word to Revelations would be. He already had the whole story in mind, but he had yet to reveal it to humanity. That, that took place over time, over a great period of time. So we have the whole story. Even the apostles didn't have the whole story. They were living the whole story, but even they didn't have the whole story. For example, the apostles did not have uh, the epistles of Paul. Not at the time of the Gospels, I mean. Not at the time of the Gospels. They didn't have Paul's writing, Paul's letters. The apostles didn't have Revelation. Obviously, John had Revelation because John wrote it. <laughs> but, the, but the Christians of their time did not have that. You see? So we have the whole story. You begin to appreciate that the more you meditate on the Scriptures. Because you, you begin to see connections and depths that the ancients wouldn't have been able to get because they didn't have the whole story. Or some of them, let's say in the very early church, some of them had the whole story, but they didn't have it in front of them. They couldn't see, they wouldn't see something, for instance, in something that Jesus said that's written down in the Gospels, in one of the Gospels. And they look at that and they say, that looks like a reference to something in Genesis. Well, they, can't, they couldn't go back and flip through to Genesis because they didn't have it in front of them. You see? So you begin to appreciate the importance of that. And because you have the whole story, you're able to dive deeper than you might have been able to do without the whole story. And there's a value to that. The fathers practiced... Now, we're talking about meditation specifically. The fathers practiced meditation um, on, on the regular. Okay, they practiced and spoke about meditation, and they and they and it, you you see it in their writings. You see about meditation in their writings, and the way they treat meditation, it's like it's as it's as essential as breathing or praying. Right, where you for you and me, prayer is normal. We just do it; it's automatic. Um, we I don't know about you, but we say grace before meals in my family, even if we're eating out. That's just automatic. That's just normal, right? If someone talks to you about, you know, the other day I was, I was praying and, and then whatever happened. Well, it doesn't stand out to you that they said they were praying. That doesn't stand out because that's normal, right? You're focusing on the, the point of why they're telling you about their, their praying. They're praying. You're focused on the point. The other day I was praying and I was so distracted. Well, what stands out is maybe the distraction, Right? They were distracted because. Maybe that stands out. The fact that they were praying doesn't stand out. That's normal, right? For the fathers, that was meditation. For the early church, meditating was as, was as no, I mean, really, meditating is prayer. It's a form of prayer. It's mental prayer, right? But for the fathers, meditation was as normal as vocal prayer is to us. It wasn't something different. That was normal. They talked about it all the time. It's in their writings all the time, as essential as breathing or praying. The fathers did not treat meditation as a devotion. We almost, I mean, when, if we become familiar with meditation, we view it almost as a devotion, like something extra. The fathers didn't think of it as something extra. They didn't see meditation 
on Scripture as a devotion. They saw it as a duty. They believed that meditation on Scripture assisted in growing in holiness, and they believed that growing in holiness helped you to meditate more deeply and have a deeper understanding of Scripture. It was, it's kind of a cycle, I guess. The holier you are, the better you're able to interpret the Bible. And the more you spend time meditating and reflecting on Scripture, the holier you become because you make yourself available to, to additional graces, deeper graces, and so on. So when we talk about meditation, if we're really being Catholic about it, it's not really something extra that we're talking about. It's something normal that we're talking about, something normal that people just don't do, or very few people do. So it's important to get into meditation. I'm going to, I did a little bit, I did a couple of podcast episodes um, on meditation. I may do them over again and go a little bit more in depth. I, I'm, I'm, I'm still deciding. If I do, it'll probably be subscriber only because I have to build up some library for uh, subscribers. But um, just fo follow me uh, and, and what I'm doing to keep up to date on that. Follow me on X at For the Queen BVM. Follow me on Facebook at Catholic Adventurer if you want to stay uh, informed uh, about when, when I do those like tutorials, I guess, or webinars on meditating on Scripture. If you don't know how to do it, I can help you get there. Everything in Scripture is there for a reason. Something important to point out, everything in Scripture is there for a reason. The reason all, isn't always apparent, but everything in there is there for a reason. And the reason is often layered. Uh, it, and I'm just making this up. It could be the most insignificant thing, like so-and-so ate an olive and then went home. Now, that, can, that seems so insignificant and like silly, like why would why would that be in there? Ate an olive and then went home. Well, it's in there for a reason. <laughs> it might have a cultural significance to the author and, and his contemporaries, but it probably has some kind of significance for us too, that, that little detail, because the Holy Spirit put it in there. And then some greater things have a layered and deeper significance. And of course, the greater things are in there for a reason too. It could be something like um, the the two thieves that were crucified with Jesus, one on his left and one on his right. There's a significance to that detail. There's a significance to that detail. Every little and major thing in Scripture is there for a reason, and the reason is usually layered, or and, and sometimes they're numerous, right? So what you get from a text, I don't know, Jesus got upset. Okay, well, what do you get from that? Well, we got that Jesus got upset. But what else can you get from it? It's layered. Jesus got upset. What does that tell you? Getting upset is not sinful. Getting angry is not sinful. Well, we know it, it must not be because Jesus got angry. What else do we get from that? Jesus got angry at a thing, at something, right? Let's say, for instance, when he cleansed the temple. He was angry at something that was going on in the temple. And what else do we get from that? Well, why did that make him angry? What else do we get from that? How did he deal with his anger? What did he do with it? What did he do about it? What else do we get from that? Let, let me give you an example. The scripture says that Jesus um, didn't take a whip down from a wall. He had to form one, right, out of cords or something. I forget how scripture puts it. Whatever it was that he was whipping around, he didn't just pull it down from a wall. He had to make it. What do we get from that? He must have been really, really upset to have the patience and the focus and determination to form a whip, not just to pull one down off the wall, but to create one, to produce one. You see, so we get a whole lot more out of that than just Jesus got upset. Jesus was angry. Everything in Scripture is there for a reason. It's layered. There are many layers. Every So-and-so ate an olive. There are many layers to why that's in there. I, and through meditation is how we dig that up. The early church fathers said that some scripture is intended to be um, confusing. Not all of them. This is not like something they said unanimously, but a, a few of them have said this or something like it, that some things in scripture, if they're difficult to understand, it's like that on purpose. The Holy Spirit did it like that 
to provoke meditation, to inspire and encourage deeper reflection in the text, uh, on the text, which I think is very interesting. That the Holy Spirit intended some of the scriptures to be a little, I'm not, so-and-so ate an apple or ate an olive. I, I don't understand why that's in there. Maybe the Holy Spirit made that vague on purpose. Because whatever the meaning is to any portion of the scripture, whatever the meaning or meanings, the multiple, the multi-layered meanings are, the Holy Spirit will reveal them to you. You're not going to get there by your intellect alone. The Holy Spirit will reveal you, reveal them to you by grace. So sometimes the Holy Spirit makes it a little confounding. You know, it it's so funny because there are some things in scripture that just confuse me to no end. Confused me, confused me, confused me. When I read it, when I reread it, re reread it, had it, you know, heard it read to me at during mass readings, um, throughout my, you know, my my study and research of, of theology, confused me, confused. And then one day, it just made sense. One day, it just made sense. Whatever the particular thing is, just made total perfect sense. Like night turned into day. And I could not understand, why did I not get this before? It's so obvious that this is what that scripture means. As obvious as one plus one is two, as obvious as, as daytime, it's so obvious this is what it means. Yet for years it escaped me. It's not your intellect alone that reveals these layers. It's the Holy Spirit through grace. And the Holy Spirit does this through grace in collaboration with your intellect. But you have, to, you have to commit your intellect to the process. The Holy Spirit's not going to force it on you. Again, this is why meditating on Scripture, not just reading it, is so important and can be so beneficial. Here's something that I want to point out. And, before, and then we're going to get to the interview. This will be the last bit that I have to say on this. And I want you to really hear me. Sometimes God will provoke meditation by putting a scripture in your head. Sometimes God will provoke or encourage meditation by putting a scripture in your head. If you find a passage of scripture lodged in your brain, and it might only be a couple of words, if you find a scripture lodged in your brain, you should devote some time meditating on it. You might find that you go to church on a Sunday and you kneel down to pray before Mass starts. And in your head, you have, be still and know that I am God. And you have, no un- you, you have no idea why that's in your head, but you can't get it out of your head. Sometimes God will put a scripture in your head to get you to meditate on it. It could be something short like that, be still and know that I am God. It could be something longer, or it could be, the image of could be the image of something that happened in scripture like the agony in the garden for some reason you have this image in your head i don't mean a vision i mean just an image maybe it's the memory of a painting of the agony in the garden that that you used to that you that you're familiar with and it keeps coming up in your head that sort of thing sometimes that when that happens when it's there mysteriously and you can't get it out of your head Usually that happens because God is trying to inspire you or provoke you, needle you to reflect and meditate on it. So don't pass up on those opportunities because you would be amazed how a little time devoted to meditation will reveal layers and dimensions in even a single word sometimes that you failed to realize were there. So pick up a Bible and read it. You don't have to read it cover to cover, and you don't even have to read large chunks of it every time you sit down to read it. Read a couple of paragraphs. Read one paragraph. Read a whole, I don't know, half a chapter, maybe a whole chapter. It depends on your level of experience. But don't just read it. Reading it is good, because you have to be familiar with what's in there. Reading it is good, but understanding it and really swimming in it is the most important thing. Read the scriptures and meditate on it. All right, so let's go to the interview. Again, um, I'm not going to do the intro because the, the interview is already, already recorded, and I'm going to do the intro there, and then I'll come right back at you with a goodbye. Let's go to Brother Alexander talking about typology.
So we're here with Alex, known online and throughout the galaxy as Brother Alexander, but he's actually not a Christian brother. We'll get into that in a second. Alex writes for Tower of Adam on Substack. Uh, you should really check out his Substack at towerofadam.substack.com. That's actually how we met. Um, he, he writes amazing stuff. You'll also find him on Twitter slash X and on Instagram. And I invited him on because I thought he, he knows a lot about typology uh, it's important, you know, we, we've been talking about uh, the importance of reading scripture, um, the uh, the perspective of the church fathers. The church fathers had a lot of techniques for reading and interpreting scripture, and typology was one of them. And so I want to say thank you for joining me, and welcome, Alex slash Brother Alexander. Welcome to the show. Thanks for inviting me. I'm looking forward to this conversation. This can be Most fun. definitely. We've been, uh, so Alex and I have had a, a this might technically be our second pre-interview. We had a pre-interview, and we we couldn't stop talking. And then at this time, getting ready for the recording of the interview, we couldn't. We had to. Alex is very good at saying, "Okay, shut up." You know, we have to move on. I'm like, "Yeah, you're right," because we can do this for hours. Um, so, Alex, talk about what you do on Substack real quick, just to get the people familiar with you. Right. So, what I try and do is I try and write just above the average homily or sermon you might get at church. So something mm. a little bit deeper. Um, I know some people may have been in church for a very long time, um, 20, 30 years, and they think, well, I've heard all these stories yeah. before. I've heard all these preachers before. But what I'm trying to do is try and say, no, there's deeper layers in Scripture. Um, right. You know, we're not supposed to just stay just drinking the milk. We've got to get into steak. You know, we've got to get, right. still, we've got to get into the firm food, and I think that's what I try to do at the at the Substack. Yeah, that's uh, I, that that really represents it nicely. Uh, you do really interesting stuff on there, and I was I was telling Alex that uh, just before we did the pre-interview, and I had known him I don't know a year on Substack as Brother Alexander. I I, I think that's where I came across that name, um, and it only occurred to me. I only thought you know last week. Oh, I wonder if he's a religious brother. But <laughs> I was so I was expecting a hood. I was expecting candle lights. I was expecting chanting in the background. Didn't get any of that. Why did you? Why do you use the the, uh, the handle, Brother Alexander? Well, really, because I want to be accessible to uh, to everybody um, within the the wider church. Um, you know, so I'm a brother, um, and you know, and as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. CA, you're a brother too. You know. In, in, in well, I like to think so. You know, thank you very much. So it's like a Christian brotherhood. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with that. You know, I refer to non-Catholic Christians who aren't crazy, um, because there are a couple that are, that are just like that's not Christian. But I refer to them as as brothers or brethren, and and I truly believe this. This is not me trying to charm people that I interact with, but the world is really crazy. I mean, it's really really crazy, and I really believe that an, an encounter with another Christian is a gift. I, and I don't even care if they're marginally liberal, which they exist, you know. Okay, you know, th so there's already some things we disagree on theologically. Maybe culturally or politically there's going to be some more things we disagree on. But I try to focus on the things that we have in common. Jesus Christ is Lord, you know. Jesus is the Son of God, and so on and so on. Because these days— Finding someone who truly believes that from their heart is a gift because it's not common like it used to be. You know, there are people who are who would rather crucify Jesus again, you know. So I, I, I think of non-Christian, uh, non-Catholic Christians as, as, as brothers, and I, th I think our Lord would want it that way, you know. So I think that's a great handle that you use. Yeah, I, I think it's really important, particularly nowadays, as you say, there's a lot of issues going on. And the other thing I find as well is that I'm, I see more the same between mm -hmm. all the major traditions of Christianity than yes. the differences. And, I, and yes. the key thing is that we all love Jesus. What is typology? What's that all about? And why, why is it important for people to know about? Yeah, typology is something I came across a few years ago. Um, and it's, it's where we see something in the, in, the, in the scriptures, in the Old Testament particularly, and then it gets reflected again in the New Testament. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's like um, uh, we see in the book of Romans. Um, so Romans 5, it talks about how, uh, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those 
whose sinning was not like the transgressions of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. And so we see the word there, type. Um, mm-hmm. And it's something that the, the early church used. And you, you see some examples of it in, in, uh, in Paul's writings, but also even Jesus uh, you know, oh, yes. even mentions it as well. Yes. And so it, it's something that the, that the early church used. And it, when you start reading the, the early church fathers, they pick up on it as well. You find it over and over again. Yeah. So it's something that for me, you know, I, I found that it's it deepens scripture. And yeah. um, I sometimes wonder as well, when we're, we're called to kind of meditate on scripture, people think, oh, it's just right. reading scripture. But actually, I think it's sometimes it's looking at scripture uh, in a typological way. And we can kind of unpack that kind of later. Right. I want to back up on something. Um, as we were prepping, you said uh, sometimes you're in church and you're hearing the sermon and you're meditating on, on the scripture. And then you started getting into that. And I says, wait, that sounds really interesting. Surprise me during the interview. I don't want to know oh, okay. about it yet. Surprise me during the interview. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, we all we all know it. We're at church and, and the, the sermon or the homily is going on. And you think, I've heard this before. I know what it's going to say next. Um, but you're thinking about the scripture that they're basing it on. And so you're sitting there and you're, you're thinking about, say, for example, uh, Isaac going up the mountain with Abraham. And he's mm-hmm. carrying sticks on his back. Um, and before he got to the mountain... Oh, I, see where, I see where you're going with this. Yeah, mm-hmm. he's on the mountain uh, and he comes to the mountain on a donkey. And I'm sitting there going, that really sounds like Jesus. <laughs> That's weird. That's weird. Yeah. And you start thinking about that. You start thinking the story of of G, of um, of Isaac going up the mountain with Abraham to be sacrificed. And then you start thinking yeah. about our Lord going yeah. up, the, up the mountain, because it's a mountain, Jerusalem's on a mountain, going up the mountain to Jerusalem, going out of the city. And in fact, they actually get uh, the same, the, the, those both events happen pretty much the same place. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And you're sitting there. You hear- and, I, you know, when that happened to me, I was sitting there thinking, wow, this is absolutely incredible. And there must, yeah. somebody must have sat next and to me, must have got, heard you've me. Got the man sac- you got the man willing to sacrifice his son, you know, to appease God. Yeah. You know, which is, that's a, <laughs> it's just, you know, it's incredible. Jesus. You want to hear an interesting layer? Isaac is asking uh, Abraham, well, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says, the Lord himself will provide the sacrifice. But another way to read that, okay, that can be read both ways from the original language. Another way to read that is the Lord will provide himself as the sacrifice, which he does in Jesus. You know, isn't that crazy? (laughs) The Bible is an incredible book. It's incredible. It's incredible. It's, It's it's so layered, you know, and this is why I tell, this is why I was, you know, telling the folks in, in, in the episode, in the show, you know, you have to read this scripture. It's not enough to have it read to you at mass. You have to read it and don't just read it like it's a story. It's, it's, it's written by the Holy Spirit in the voice of men, but it's written by the Holy Spirit intentionally to get you to dive deeper. If something looks confusing, the Holy Spirit wanted it that way to en- encourage you to think more deeply about it, you know? Um, the, the, the scripture itself is, is so incredible, the way that it's put together. Med- exactly. Meditation is on scripture, and part of that is looking at the typology. It really does open up and help us to understand right. better. Because one of the things as well is that this, coming back to this Romans text, when we're looking at um, Adam and Jesus, when we look at them typology, uh, typologically, what we're seeing is that um, Adam is like a, 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 a is, sorry, let me say, it's, uh, Jesus is the template and mm-hmm. Adam is part of that pattern. The word typology, um, this word type, it actually comes from um, creating coins. So if you know this, mm-hmm. okay, so the whole idea is... We, I, I didn't know this, no. So the whole idea about making coins is you get a silver disc or a gold disc, or a metal disc, uh, you get a a template, which has got a pattern on it, and you bash the template into the coin to create an impression. So what Paul is doing here, he's saying that a type, so Adam is a type of Jesus. 
Okay, so what that means right. is that Adam has a pattern of Christ in him, and so right. when you step back, you think, "Well, what's that mean?" It's, it's a strange thing to say. So the way to say it is that Adam sinned, but Jesus mm -hmm. didn't sin. So there's right. that's a typological link. You've got another one where through Adam, yeah, through Adam, death came into the world, but through Christ life came into the world. Let's talk about some types of the cross. That's the the main crux yeah. I guess we're, we're going toward is types of the cross, things that foreshadow the cross or things that are echoed, I guess, in a way by the cross, by the crucifixion of Christ. Tell us a little bit about that. Right, yeah. So um, we see the cross typologically appearing all over the place in the Old Testament. Um, mm. So normally if you see something woody, See something woody in the, in the Old Testament, just pause for a moment and think, uh, is, is, that, is that the cross? Is that kind of like typologically right. linked to the cross? So, so uh, right. Pick up the clues. Pick yeah, up the pick clues, up the clues when you come across. Them. Yeah. And so one of them could be like Noah's Ark. So, um, so if you think about Noah's Ark, Noah's Ark was manufactured out of wood. The cross was also mm -hmm. manufactured out of wood. So there's the typological link. Um, uh, another thing is that um, the the ark is used to uh, save people from God's judgment, um, and the cross, you know, it's, it's, it's you know the, the cross is used to save people from God's judgment, you know, through Christ. Right. Um, right. So you you see this connection, and then the next step you make is to say, okay, so let's look at the cross through the lens of the story of Noah's Ark. Is there a deeper understanding or is there a, uh, an interesting understanding we can find through this to help us to understand what was happening at the cross? Right. You know, and so you, you could say, well, Noah's, Noah is in the ark with his family. It's stormy outside. The, you know, the, the rain's coming down. The floods are coming up. So this is a time of trial. Right. So you, then you think about Christ, right. Christ on the cross. It's a time of trial. And you can, right. you can connect those two stories together, and, it, and you start thinking about it, yeah. and you, you meditate on it. It's, it's, it's life from tragedy. It's life from tragedy. Tell me about the typology of, you know, it's a funny story. Someone, um, not, not someone, many people were freaking out. There was some, it was a, a, a Catholic, I don't remember if it was a person who was making them by hand or if it was a Catholic store online, they were selling these rosaries where the, the cross um, had uh, some symbolism that they said that the people were saying was demonic. And people all over the internet were freaking out. Okay. And as they're going through the description of it, you know, there's a triangle and there's a, there's a snake wrapping around it. And I'm thinking to myself, that doesn't sound demonic. I said, I thought, that sounds familiar. I swear I've seen this symbolism. I couldn't, I didn't see the cross. No one had sent me a picture of it, just a description. But it was the bronze serpent. All of the symbolism on this cross that they were freaking out over was actually very, very Christian. But can you go through the symbolism and, ty and the, the typological um, significance of what we saw in the story of Moses and the brown serpent and how it connects to, to, to Christ on the cross? So the story goes that um, the Moses and the Israelites um, start grumbling and God decides to send all these venomous serpents, these venomous snakes, to, uh, to bite them. And Moses cries out to God and says, look, we've sinned, we have spoke against the Lord and against you. And what right. God says is, right, take a snake, put it on a pole, right? And then everybody who looks at this snake will be saved. All those that don't right. will die. And it's just like so it wasn't an weird. actual snake though. He had to he had to cast a, he had to yeah. cast a snake made of bronze. That's right. It wasn't an actual snake. And then Jesus references this right. in the book of John, saying, "Look, I'm going to be like that snake," you know. And how does he? Re I didn't know that. Yeah. So is this when he said, "When the Son of Man will be lifted up"? And that's correct. Do you do you have it handy? Yeah, Because sure. I don't re remember it verbatim. Yeah. So could, could you? Yeah. Could you reference that? Because I think that's interesting. So John three verse fourteen. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Right, okay. right, so right, right, right. when you actually look at the Hebrew, you kind of work out what's going on. 
So the the name for these venomous snakes is uh, in Hebrew is called nakash. That's so mm-hmm. it's nakash. What God says to Moses to cast and put on the pole was a seraph. So seraph. Mm. So it's a different animal. So it's like okay. So what is the difference? And the key is when. What is it? A different? Is it a different species of snake? Oh, it's far more interesting than that. When you go to a, a, okay, yeah. When you go to Ezekiel and Isaiah, and you come across the same word, it's translated as seraphim, hmm. which is obviously an angel. Jesus references this in John three as, um, and he says that just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So Jesus is using this kind of typological language. He's saying, look, I am like uh, the serpent, on the, the bronze serpent on the pole. Um, so therefore, if Christ is saying, I am like the bronze serpent on the pole, therefore the pole is a type of cross. Hmm. Tell me about trees in Eden. Now, there's one, I'm not like some big you know, typology expert, but trees in Eden is one that I know almost nothing about. That sounds very interesting. Yeah. So with the cross, obviously it looks like a tree. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, it's, um, if you saw a silhouette of it, you'd be like, oh, that looks like it's kind of a tree. Right. Um, and so obviously the trees in Eden, um, they point to uh, point to the cross. They are a type of a cross. So I think it'd be really good if we just focus on the tree of life, because I think that's, Okay. There's some beautiful symbol symbology and typology around that. So, as we know, Adam and Eve, um, they weren't supposed to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right. Um, and the whole idea is, if they pass this test, then they would then be able to eat from the tree of life. And um, the tree of life, if you ate of the fruit of the tree of life, then you would be granted eternal life. This is kind of the idea. So if we're saying that the tree of life is a type of cross, then we have to ask the question, well, what is the fruit of the cross? Well, it's Christ. He's the one that hangs on the cross. Mm. So the fruit hangs from a tree. Oh. Oh. Okay, so, yeah, so when we feed on Christ, typologically, we're also feeding on the tree of life. That's so fascinating. You know, and so... Again, but the thing, what we have to be careful with typology, it might be good to say this as well, is that ty- typology should not replace doctrine. Correct. Okay. Right. Typology is just a way of helping us meditate on scripture right. and help us to understand scripture deeper. Right. Um, and the, the other thing is, I need to mention as well the joy of typology. There is joy in it. Um, the number of times that I've said to, to people, oh, have you noticed connection? And suddenly their eyes just light up because they suddenly think, that's incredible. And it's almost like when you're watching a murder mystery and suddenly at the end, the murderer gets revealed. And it's like, wow, it's a shock. I think sometimes you do get that kind of little bit of a buzz when you you notice something for the first time. You think, I've never noticed that. And I know in our pre-interview, we were talking about Jesus eating the fish. Jesus eating the fish. And And I I, I was was saying to Alex... (laughs) Like, that's such a weird thing to throw in there, Jesus eating the fish. Um, and then Alex, uh, well, go ahead, tell the story, Alex. Yeah, so, and then I pointed out, well, what about Jonah? He was eaten by the fish. Right. But then Christ says, no, no, no I eat the fish. Right, because Christ is, Jonah is, is, I guess it's accurate to say it's a type of Christ. Jonah is swallowed by the whale yeah. for three days. Christ is in the tomb for three days. You Which know, and then Christ actually mentions directly. That's the top, topological sign. Yeah. 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 So it's it's fascinating. It it also shows this it also shows God's sense of humor. <laughs> There's a lot of humor in the scriptures. There's a lot yeah. of humor in the scriptures. You know, yeah. and some uh, of it's quite dry. <laughs> some of it is dry. Dry humor. Yeah. Dry some, humor. some of it is dry. You know, God is a Vulcan, I guess. Some of it yeah. is very dry. Um and some of it is like, ooh, I see what you did there, Lord. I see what you did there. You know, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, the, the scriptures are beautiful. And the more we meditate on it, the more we think about it, the more it changes our lives. It gets inside of us. Yeah. It changes us. So uh, and uh, topology uh, is, the, is a pattern for that. Yeah. And I'll, I'll throw this out there for the people's consideration. 
You know, like why, you know, this almost seems like it's just fun to put together a puzzle, but then what's the point once it's put together? Well, there, there's a point to meditating and there's a point to, you know, ty and typology is just one um, method. You know, there, there are several others, which um, I'll get into in a series over time that might be subscriber only, but um, it's not that typology is the only, I guess, a, a device for reading and interpreting scripture. There are others, but here's one reason, one example of why typology can be helpful. Meditate on Christ at the pillar, <clears throat> which, Alex, we can talk for an hour just about yeah. that, that, yeah. okay, Christ at the pillar during the scourging. And think about how vulgar it is that Jesus Christ, that God, is being scourged, hands bound to a pillar, a tree that he made. This is his creation, Right, And now it binds him as he takes this beating from the Romans. And you think, well, okay, so it's, it's the tree of life, okay, and it's wood. Yeah, it's wood that was a tree that was created by God. It's part of the divine order and so on and so on. And then you have a deeper sense of how vulgar this beating was, you know? Like, oh, my God, God is bound to a tree that he made, he knows this tree like he knows my name, this very tree what, you know, what, that produced this pillar. And it does. It takes you into something deeper. It takes you more intimately into what's happening in the Scripture, what's being taught to us by God in the Scripture. So it's not, it's not just a device to have fun with, but it is. It is that. But it really does draw you deeper. It draws you more deeply into the life of what's behind those words because it's not just words and paper. There's life. There's a person behind it, you know, and it draws you into it. That's all I had to say about that. Sorry. So, Alex, we're going a little long. So why don't you pick yeah. out one more thing you wanted to talk a little bit about, and then uh, let's bring this to a close. Is that okay with you? Yeah. Should we just talk about the the other famous tree in the Garden of Eden? Oh, which the tree the of uh, uh, life and knowledge of good and evil. Yes. Yeah, sure. Or good and bad. You know, you, you can translate it either way. Um, yeah, so again, these are trees. So you think, oh, are these related to the cross in typologically? And the answer is yes. Mm. Um, so if you picture the scene of the crucifixion, you've got Christ on the cross, and then to one side of him, he's got a criminal. The other side, he's got another criminal. Oh, and so one and of these criminals... Evil, or good and good bad. And evil. Mm. Yeah, so you've got like the penitent thief and you've got the thief that rejects. You've got the good and the bad. Um, and so you, you've got this imagery going on. And I think one thing you see in typology is that sometimes the typological link is the reverse. Mm. And so if uh, we know, so, so for example, if we know that Christ is the fruit of the tree of life, he's the fruit of the cross, um, but he's also the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of evil. Now, God tells Adam to not eat from the tree of the knowledge of evil. That's fine enough, yeah. But he gets tempted by the devil, and then he eats it, and everything goes wrong. But with Christ on the cross, we are we are told by God to feed on Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, and so maybe sometimes we're tempted, or we're, we're not. You know, we're not good enough. You know, to come to God, we're not good enough to, um, you know, come to Eucharist or whatever. But actually, it's a command that we need to feed on Christ. And so rather than we've got the situation where Adam was told not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, we're told to eat of the cross. In the, so in the Catholic tradition, in, in, or in Catholicism, I mean, try not to dress it up un, un, unnecessarily, um, there is, so you have to be in a state of grace before you can receive communion. Any questions about that, talk to your confessor. But, and I say this all the time, um, we need to receive communion. But Alex, you put it in, I don't know if you could see it in my face that you had my spiels, my spiels, my wheels spinning, but you put it in my head that Jesus, God tells us, you have to eat. You have to eat, not it's not just you ought to eat, you might want to eat, you should eat. It tells us you have to eat. And there are, you know, and Paul says just, you better discern very carefully before you eat of the bread and take of the cup, you know, or you could be consuming your own condemnation. There are times where we shouldn't present ourselves for communion. But, and again, I say this a lot, 
Communion is serious stuff. We need it. We need it, you know. Um, but Alex, I, I never thought of it from the way that you're talking about it, where God goes from commanding Adam and Eve not to eat to later commanding us to eat. Um, I don't know. It just has me on a whole new, a whole other train of, of, of thinking. Like, that's yeah, fascinating. Well, I hadn't thought of well, it from that angle. Well, you see, you know, where Christ says, unless you, unless you eat of me, you have unless no you drink my blood you. and eat my flesh, yeah, you're not part of me. And I think it is, so there is a command. There, there is a command that we need to feed on Christ. But mm. you're right. We also need to make sure that we're in the right place yeah. to do so. Yeah. You know, because it is serious. Yeah. Um, uh, I completely agree with that. We we hear a lot in, in the Catholic sphere, you know, communion is not a reward, it's medicine. I don't like the whole medicine analogy, but I, I it's true what they're saying. It's not a reward. Like, we need... One of the reasons why I don't like the medicine analogy is because, yes, the Eucharist heals us of, you know, it, it heals us, it sustains us, yada, yada, yada. But... The Eucharist is different. The Eucharist gives us life. It doesn't just give us healing. It gives us life. Yes, it's not a reward, but it's something much, much, much more important than just medicine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, but I, I, the reason I bring that up is when you say, when, when you say something like God commands us to eat, it, it, further, it furthers the point that the Eucharist is not a reward. We need it. You know, we need it, and we need what it is, and we need everything that it represents. You know, life in our Lord Jesus Christ, consuming uh, his body and blood, and, and so on and so on. It, it just gives it a different urgency when you make that point that God commands us to eat. Alex, thank you so much, brother, for, for coming on and talking to me. Why don't you go ahead and plug your socials? Where can people find you? Where can people read you? Um, let us know. Go ahead. Right, so I write the Tower of Adam substack, which is where I do my Bible study. I also write a Gloria on Substack as well, and that's where I do a bit more uh, in-depth theology or cultural commentary or just things that kind of take my fancy. I also write, uh, because as you can probably hear, I'm an Englishman, so I write uh, another Substack called Tales of Old England Christendom, which talks about Anglo-Saxon Christianity, if you're interested in that. Which which um, I, I used to read, not regularly, but I, I had read a lot of that. And that that's actually how I how I met you. And I thought it was so so much fun and so fascinating and such a unique idea. You know, it's, uh, and the writing is just beautiful. Mm -hmm. The, the Anglo-Saxon had a particular way of looking at things. Um, also, I'm on the usual places. So you can find me on Instagram under Tower of Adam. I'm on Twitter under the same name and on YouTube as well. So uh, come along and follow me there. It'd be great to see you. I will be placing links to, in case you uh, need a link, you don't want to do the typing, I will be placing links to everywhere you can find Alex on this episode's um, description page, it's on demand page, and so on. Alex, I just want you to know, it took everything in my my power not to introduce you by saying fee fi fo fum I smell the blood of an Englishman. <laughs> it took a lot for me to not go there because I'm a bit of a nut. I'm a bit of a goof. So I was this close, brother. This close. Fee, fi, oh, fo, I'm, fum, that close. I'm a very proud Englishman. I love being English. <laughs> We're the butt of everyone's jokes. Well, you wear it well. I'll tell you, you wear it well. <laughs> Thanks for joining me, brother. God, God be with you. You too. Thank you. And again, that was Brother Alexander, who writes on Substack. You'll also find him uh, on Twitter. At Al, I will drop links to his socials um, on this episode's On Demand page. Thank you so much for joining me today, talking about the importance of meditation on Scripture and mental prayer uh, and so on. Uh, I hope you got something out of it, and I hope it brings you a little closer to holiness and closer to sainthood. I have been the Catholic Adventurer, and this has been yet another episode of The Catholic Experience. Find me on Twitter slash X. At For the Queen BVM, you'll find me on Facebook and YouTube at Catholic Adventurer. I'm very active on X, so if you join me there, you're going to get a whole lot more uh, wisdom and goodness. Thank you for listening. God bless you. God be with you all. Bye-bye.